Well, I want to thank Tom and Indeed. I'd like to thank all of my colleagues who joined the Helen Stein Center this year for our conference in Washington. I'm very proud of, of how uh, you have, I think, raised the tone of the conversation about this presidency and given us great insights. I want to start off by asking you a couple of questions. Listen to the wording. The, the wording is very important. How many of you think George W. Bush is conservative? No one in this room? <laughs> one? Two? Okay, come on, be brave. That's what I tell my undergraduates. Okay, a handful of you. Second question. How many of you think that George W. Bush is a conservative? A conservative. There's a difference there. Okay, we've got more hands there. All right. Well, my title for this paper is The Anatomy of a Divorce. Conservatives versus George W. Bush. I've set you up. <laughs> Got those of you who already are committed to this. But last year in the Wall Street Journal, former Reagan speechwriter Peggy Noonan opined that conservative Bush supporters have felt like battered wives. If you don't like the dramatic increases in federal spending, too bad. If you don't like the intrusion of big government in your lives, too bad. If you don't like the way the war in Iraq has been managed or mismanaged, too bad. Noonan's words were an emperor has no clothes moment for a number of conservatives who had been reluctant to criticize President Bush openly up to that point. Now in this paper I propose to look into why prominent conservative opinion leaders began distancing themselves from the 43rd president well before election day 2008 and even before election day 2004. We will get to the divorce from Bush in a moment, but the first order of business, it seems to me, is to provide some context. This is something Casey Pipes was trying to do in his talk. Provide a little context, both theoretical and historical, to explain how it happens in American history that opinion leaders who are originally support of, supportive of a president come to break with their president. There are at least four factors that contributed to bringing about these uh, messy divorces. First, Sir Isaiah Berlin observed that there has always been an inherent tension between the intellectual class and the political class. The trouble with academics and commentators is that they care more about whether ideas are interesting rather than whether they are true. Politicians live by ideas just as much as professional thinkers do, but they can't afford the luxury of entertaining ideas that are merely interesting. They have to work with a small number of ideas that happen to be true and an even smaller number of ideas that happen to be applicable to real life. In academic life, false ideas are merely false and useless ones can be fun to play with. In political life, false ideas can ruin the lives of millions and useless ones can waste precious resources. An intellectual's responsibility for his ideas is to follow their consequences wherever they may lead. A politician's responsibility is to master those consequences and prevent them from doing harm. That's the, really the essence of Berlin's argument. Second part of this context. Our winner-take-all system can aggravate the tension by encouraging compromise. Our system lives on compromise. We are taught that we have a two-party system that tends to suppress third parties. And in most elections, people don't want to throw away their votes on a candidate who really doesn't have a chance to win. What has evolved over the past 100 years, however, is a four-party system. And this is brilliantly laid out by Professor Gary Gregg at the University of Louisville. And you see how it works in the presidential primaries. In 1992, for example, the moderate Republican Party was represented by George H.W. Bush. The more conservative Republican Party was represented by Pat Buchanan. The moderate Democratic Party was represented by Bill Clinton. And the more liberal Democratic Party was represented by Jerry Brown, Governor Moonbeam. Moonbeam. Now, the winner-take-all system established by the Electoral College encourages the moderates and the true believers in the same party to merge in order to win elections. As we see repeatedly in American history, ideas are moderated, compromised, and amended in this merging process. This merging often leads to dissatisfaction among opinion leaders 
And when the true believers among them become frustrated by the compromises of the president, they face a tough choice. Either stay at home and suffer or get a divorce. And at key turns in American history, opinion leaders have served their president papers. And that leads to the third contributing factor in political divorces from a president. On numerous occasions, the true believers in a party have split with their president because there were too many compromises, too many violations of principle. SMU political scientist Joseph Kabilka has traced these breaks, and they go back centuries in our history. Indeed, he calls the Declaration of Independence the culmination of this petitioning process, whose roots go back to Magna Carta and the Petition of Right back in 1628 that Parliament presented to King Charles I. In North America, in the aftermath of the French and Indian War, this petition tradition was carried forward by our able lawyers and revolutionaries, men like James Otis and John Dickinson, Sam Adams, John Wilson, of course, Thomas Jefferson, all asserting the rights of British subjects in North America against the arbitrary rule of Parliament and King. American writers and leaders had no trouble carrying on the tradition they had inherited from Britain, and Jefferson famously, famously, if surreptitiously, broke from the indispensable man himself, George Washington, even though he had already served as his Secretary of State. And a few years later, high Federalists, egged on by Alexander Hamilton, broke from their president, John Adams. This occurred in the months leading up to the election of 1800, during the Quasi War with France, and arguably it is one of the factors that led to a change in the party, occupying the White House. In the last half century, as the last example, the most famous divorce between the president and opinion leaders in his own party occurred in 1968. Who can forget Chicago, 1968, when prominent Democrats broke with Lyndon Johnson over the conduct of the Vietnam War. In fact, Johnson, of course, had already said he wouldn't run for re-election that year. He had been so demoralized. This split, too, contributed to a change in the party that would win the White House that year. Now, a fourth factor explains these divorces. Look at the nature of political movements. Not one political movement that attains any size in our country is a monolith. Not the Greens, not the Progressives, not the Liberals, and certainly not the Conservatives. Russell Kirk has argued that classical conservatism is not an ideolo ideology, but a temperament. In the American context, the conservative tries to carry forward the culture and institutions that maintain a justly ordered freedom. This traditionalist conception of conservatism has hardly anything in common with the libertarian emphasis on self-interested individuals in a free market, or with the neocons' ideological mission to expand America's power and influence abroad. In post-World War II America, it took the tireless efforts of two great unifiers to turn conservatism into anything resembling a movement. Starting in 1955, William F. Buckley brought together the anti-communists, the libertarians, and the traditional Catholics and Anglo-Catholics in the pages of National Review, while in 1980, Ronald Reagan added Protestant evangelicals and Jewish neoconservatives to make a potent political coalition. This is the coalition, though it showed many, many signs of fraying that George W. Bush inherited in 2000 when he became the 43rd President of the United States. So, to sum up the argument thus far, four factors, the inherent tension between intellectuals and politicians, our winner-take-all system encouraged by the Electoral College, the Anglo-American tradition of dissent going all the way back to Magna Carta, and fractious movements all bear on the high-profile divorce that took place between prominent conservative opinion leaders and President George W. Bush 